Greetings and welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, your host. Now, lately around ABWE, where we record the Missions Podcast, things have been, well, quite frankly, in the middle of a very busy season. We've got many exciting things going on, an exciting new project in Papua New Guinea that we're drawing attention to, our annual conference of hundreds of missionaries that gather from all over the world and join us in Baltimore, Maryland. There's just a number of things coming up here soon on the horizon. But of course, we want to continue to serve you well and bring you fresh content. And so this week, we're taking a little bit of a break from our normal routine to bring you a presentation of a lecture that I had the privilege of delivering to the local chapter of the C.S. Lewis Institute program just a few short weeks ago. Now, the title of the talk was something like Doing Apologetics in Clown World. I (laughs) I don't remember exactly what I titled it, man. It was something along those lines. But the goal is to address the question of what do missionaries need to know about apologetics and not just the importance of defending our faith. Yes, we need to do that, but also how. Because as we know on this show, methodology matters. The way that we go about ministry matters just as much as the message that we carry. And there's multiple schools of thought with regard to apologetics. Which one has the most biblical merit and which one is the one that we need in these especially trying days here culturally in the West? And so without further ado, we're going to bring you that presentation. But first, just a note. If you want to reach out to the show, let us know how we're doing or give us any questions or suggestions. Email alex at missionspodcast.com. And if this show is a blessing to you, share it with a friend. And also remember to leave it a five-star rating and review in your podcast platform of choice. All right, no more delay. Let's get now into this lecture from the C.S. Lewis Institute on Apologetics. As we turn to the text of Scripture this morning, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And we'll be in these verses here. Of course, we'll go around a little bit. But this is the classic text telling us about the defense of the faith. And maybe you can relate to the way that I sort of feel inadequate in these conversations lately. Uh, Mask or no mask, right? Whether or not it's easy to approach someone, whether or not you, you can start a conversation, you can see them smiling back, those sorts of things that we've had to wrestle with over the last few years. There's also a mask over people's hearts. We know that spiritually, that there's a veil that lies over the heart, and that's the real source of the opposition. And so my goal this morning, and you could be the judge of whether or not I accomplished this, but my goal this morning is to cut through that malaise, to cut through that apathy that some of us feel about having apologetic conversations and to argue with the power that Peter gives us here in this passage. So let's read this. Again, this is the word of the Lord. This is 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is within you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that be God's will, than for doing evil. Grass withers the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the reading of your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so our main theme for this morning that we'll unpack is that rather than fear in man, the apologist must fear God, be ready, and suffer well in a hostile world for the glory of God in a hostile culture. Again, I'll give that to you again. Rather than fear in man, the apologist must fear God and be ready and suffer well in a hostile world for the glory of God in titling this message, I actually titled it in my notes here, Defending Your Faith in Cloud World. That's how I'm approaching this, because we do live in hostile territory here. And the apologist Peter calls us to do these three things. But who is the apologist in this passage that's called out to give 
a defense. Is this for elites only or is this for all believers? It's one of the first things that we have to answer in looking at this text. Of course, we get some of the answer from the context of the book of Peter. So let's just consider here that two months ago in March, when I was here, we were in 1 Peter chapter 2, considering verses 9 and following, which outline the fact that all of Christ's people in Christ, just like Adam, and just like Christ who perfected these offices of prophet, priest, and king, all of us have prophetic, priestly, and kingly functions to serve as believers. We learn that prophetically we are to be proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are a kingdom of priests. We're a nation of priests. We intercede and bring others into God's presence like priests did in the Old Testament, like Christ does as our one true high priest. And we take dominion in Christ's name, right? We make disciples of all nations because Christ is king and we have a royal function as well in following him. So these statements that were made that we looked at two months ago, these apply to all of the body of Christ here. And so the key question is, if this applies to us as well here too, these instructions that we should give defense, then how? How do we live on mission in this way? Well, thinking back again to the chapter two, where Peter says that you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He goes on from there to explain what that apologetic looks like. And he gives them the surprise of apologetic and apologetic of submission. So throughout the rest of chapter two, he tells them, First, to submit to civil magistrates, rulers, in verses 13 through 17. He tells slaves to submit to masters, in verses 18 through 20. Then he encourages wives to submit to their husbands, whether they're believers or not, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And then he turns and also commands compassion and humility towards wives on the part of husbands, in chapter 3, verse 7, and for fellow believers, in verse 8. And then finally, even for our enemies, in verse 9. So he hears a lot about the way that we walk this out. And finally, that brings us to this passage here. And at the time that Peter is writing, already clown world has started. Already public opposition to the name of Christ is beginning to gain momentum. He's writing somewhere between 62 and 63 AD, maybe as late as 65. Well, history tells us that in 64 AD is the great fire throw, which the Emperor Nero blames on the Christians. And the persecution amplifies there to a whole new level. Already, opinion was beginning to turn. Also, uh, after the first century, Justin Martyr, the church father who lived from 100 to 165, he wrote in his first apology to defend Christians against the accusations that were coming against them. They were called atheists, not because they didn't believe in God, but because they didn't believe in the gods, the Roman gods. So they were accused of atheism. They were uh, accused of immorality, and they were accused of being disloyal to the Roman Empire. And then in Justin Martyr's second apology, he refutes false accusations that the Christians are engaged in sexual licentiousness and immorality, and that Christians are cannibals, because after all, they consume the body and the blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. So there's these misunderstandings of who Christians are as well. So it's no surprise that Peter writing a generation earlier, is already writing to believers who are finding themselves in the midst of misunderstandings. He's writing to an audience that should be expected to suffer. You ever been out in nature, if you're at a a zoo, wherever you are, right? You're around animals and somebody says, oh, don't be afraid of that animal. Why? Because it's what? It's more afraid of you than you are of it. So sometimes the fear is mutual. The fear goes both ways. In the context of this passage, the world is afraid of believers. And of course, the believers have a lot to potentially be afraid of. So Peter's addressing all of the believers, not just the elites. And he's helping them deal with this scenario of fear. About a year ago, last year, Aaron Wren, he's a a political, social commentator. He's, he's been in a number of different fields. Uh, he, he writes a newsletter and he speaks broadly to a number of different issues, especially touching uh, masculinity in the church. Aaron Wren put out an article in First Things Magazine entitled The Three Worlds of American Evangelicalism. He, he describes this three worlds paradigm. And he talks about the one period from 
roughly the 60s through the 80s or 90s that he calls the positive world. This is the period in which to be a Christian meant that you had social capital because of it. So this is the era in which people, even if they weren't believers, would say that they were believers because it would benefit them. It would get them so far. He calls that positive world. Again, narrowly looking at American politics, American life, but he makes that case. Then he shifts to the neutral world, the 90s through the early 2010s. The neutral world is this space where to be a Christian, at least publicly, neither causes you to gain nor lose social capital, social standing in the eyes of others. It's neutral. So you have individuals like Barack Obama, Lori Clinton, who during their presidential runs are saying such things as, of course, I'm not in favor of gay marriage, right? There, there, there's still an attempt to maintain a facade of cultural Christianity or, or moral sorts of uh, sentiments that are related to Christianity, but those aren't being followed through on. Everyone knows that we're lying about this. We're in this state of neutrality. You're still free to talk, still free to share your ideas and beliefs, but it's no longer a social benefit to you. And then he places us now in what he calls the negative world, where to claim the name of Christ publicly loses social capital. You are now considered less, but you are now considered other, an outsider, a threat to society. There was the leaked FBI memo identifying traditional Latin masses as places for right-wing radicals to be formed. So to be a Roman Catholic, right, would, would make you an enemy of the state, potentially, in this paradigm. That's how quickly things devolved with Obergefell and that ruling really being the watership home. That's what he describes. And Peter, in this passage, the, the challenge of this world that he gives us is to how, how do we defend our faith in that moment? How do we do that in the neutral, excuse me, the negative world? And how do we defend our faith without having to be an expert in archeology, span astrophysics, in law, in history, in geology, philosophy? Because so many of the defenses of the faith really do ask that you become an expert in all these disciplines. So the task that we have is vital. So Peter gives us here three things to focus on. These are the three that we already referenced in that opening statement, and we'll go through each of those. The first activity for us to focus on is that we should fear God. Look at verse 15 with me. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. We are to fear God. We are in our hearts to honor Christ the Lord as holy. But one of the things that all the commentaries point out that this passage is that Peter is shifting the focus to the internal dimension. So we can say all sorts of things about the world external and the importance of taking a public stand. You'll never take a public stand unless you first take a private stand, unless you first commit in your heart. And so Peter emphasizes, hey, this is in your heart. Recognize that that's where it begins. You have to be a Christian in private before you can be a Christian in public. And it's a good opportunity for us to sort of check our gut this morning, approaching apologetics and approaching our witness. Because maybe you come to this week as C.S. Lewis, and maybe you're one of those people that gets excited, but maybe you're also one of those who you sort of dread it, right? Because you know that you're going to be challenged here on out to be a little bit more outspoken in the faith. And maybe you hate getting out of your comfort zone in that way. And Peter would have us ask, what is the state of our hearts? Does the Lord have our hearts? And if he doesn't, who or what does have our hearts? He says, in our hearts, to honor as holy or to sanctify or to consecrate it. All words that mean the same thing. Christ the Lord. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. So this is an image of an inward sort of setting apart of Christ as Lord in one's interior person and thought process. I heard a story years ago. I served in a missions agency, and so we're privileged to be able to hear all sorts of missions stories all the time. 
heard a story of a Hindu priest, a missionary encountered this individual. He goes into his house and he sees all of these sorts of idols on this Hindu family's shelf. Uh, excuse me, I think I jumbled that a little bit. The Hindu priest goes into a Hindu family's house and sees all of these idols on the shelf. And this Hindu family was being exposed to the work of this missionary, being exposed to Christianity for the first time. And so on the shelf, full of all their little household gods, next to it was a picture of Jesus. And he's just sort of added to the line. Well, this priest, a Hindu priest, mind you, says, well, what, is, what is that one doing up there? They say, well, you know, it's this thing. He says, no, this one is the God of gods. The Hindu priest knew this. Next time the missionary visited that house, all the other gods were gone. Only Jesus remained. The even pagans recognize there's a hierarchy here, right? Inwardly, what's on your shelf? Are there multiple things on your mantle? Or is Christ alone on the mantle of your heart? But let's think about the significance of this phrase here. Honor Christ to the Lord as holy. In fact, the word the, the definite article is missing from the Greek text here. Could be rather honor Christ as Lord. Last night we talked about in the apologetic task, our first commitment has to be to the Lordship of Christ. There are ways of arguing for the faith that undermine the faith by putting the unbeliever on the throne and putting God in an abandoned state. That is not what we're about. The unbeliever is on trial. God is the judge. We have to be first and foremost committed to Christ as the ultimate authority, even over the very argument and conversation that we're having with folks. But you know, sometimes when you read a passage of scripture, you read it over and over again and doesn't quite strike you. And then all of a sudden something jumps out at you that you didn't see before. And I confess for years, I read this and I didn't notice the echo of Isaiah chapter eight. Verses 11 through 15. Just listen to this and see if you hear the similarities. Now, this is as Assyria is rising as a world superpower on the global stage, and it's about to wipe apostate northern Israel off the map as God's judgment for its idolatry. And Judah and the South is watching this thinking, oh no, we're next. And so they had reason to fear as well. Isaiah says, For the Lord spoke. Thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of his people saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. it. Well, in the New Testament, Paul quotes some of those words as well. We learn that Christ, he's ultimately that tripping block, that stumbling stone, that some people are going to understand and embrace it. Other people are just going to fall over him. But did you catch that? The Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. Yahweh Sabaoth, Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies. He's the one you should fear. Not the Assyrians that are coming to take you. Not all of the unbelievers, the pagans that are coming your way. They'll be defeated someday. They'll stand before the judge. Christ's people will remain. Amen. Amen. The current people may be more against the Christian faith that they will have their hour before God as judge. We are on the winning side. Let's carry that confidence in to our conversations. There's an old Puritan work. The title of it is The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And the meaning of that title is this, that you can't love the things of God more than your sin with, without having wonderful uh, affection replace another. I can't just turn off something in my heart and then choose on my own to, to ship it over here. I have to love the things of God more than the sins to which I so closely claim it. Right? You have to replace the love of sin with the love of something better and more beautiful. Well, fear works the same way. You don't cast out all fear and intimidation with evangelism, with apologetics, 
by stoically sort of fearing nothing. You make the Lord your dread. You make him your fear. And in 1 Peter, the ESV, it says, Honor Christ the Lord as holy. Think of the significance of that. Christ is that Lord of hosts. Peter is a first century monotheistic Jew. And his readers knew this passage if they had a Jewish background. And Peter is saying, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, the I am, the one who spoke to Isaiah, the one who spoke to Moses in the bush, the one self-existent God is Jesus. Jesus is Yahweh. So fear and honor him and let him be the only one on your shelf in your heart. That Jesus, as Lord, as Yahweh, let him be the one that you fear. Let him be the one that you dread. And then all of a sudden, all of the unbelieving forces coming against you so violently will be less intimidating. We have to let the fear of God cast out the fear of man. And so with that in mind, he calls us to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the boat that is within you. So this is the task of apologetics. And so our second point is to be ready. We have to fear God. And secondly, we have to be ready. And we have to be ready with this reasoned defense of the faith. And so we'll talk about the nature of that defense, the apologia, in a moment. But just note here that this action is both passive and active. So in one sense of the term, yes, we're supposed to be passively ready for whatever's going to come our way. But when Jesus sends out his disciples in Luke chapter 12, there's a sort of passivity where they're, they're dependent on the Lord to give them words in that moment. You know this passage. He says, and when they bring you before synagogues and rulers of authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what should you say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you should say. We could all stop there, right? We do trust God. He will ultimately give us the words that we need in these conversations. So in one sense, we're passive. In another sense, we're to be active in this task. Remember when my son played Little League and they were young, it was T-ball. You get the typical T-ball types of stories, you know, these little boys out picking motors, walking around, you know, Picking flowers, flowers is better. Yeah. yeah, that's not that. And their coach, Phil, he would always say to them, guys, baseball stands, baseball stands. He wanted them to stand ready. They're in the outfield, right? We know that there's a stance that's ready for action. And Peter had said to the same group of believers in 1 Peter 1, just a few chapters back, to gird up the loins of your mind, setting your hope fully on the grace that will be displayed to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. So to gird up the loins of your mind in the first century, men are wearing these skirt things, right? You got to weave the lower part of the fabric up. You got to hoist it around your waist. You got to tie it up into a kind of weird giant diaper so that you're ready for battle. You can't be running into battle with a sword and a skirt on. You got to tie that mess up, right? That's what it needs to gird up the loins of your mind. Make your mind ready for action. Sharpen your blade. Get ready for combat. We're not just supposed to passively resign ourselves to, well, whatever words God gives me in the moment. Yes, but also be active, be ready. Be in baseball stance. And Paul did this as well. Listen to these words from Colossians chapter four. This is even when Paul is in prison. Now, if you're in prison, you're pretty passive. Really can't control which guests come to you, who you get to talk to, what you get to say and do on any given day. This is when he is in chains for the gospel and yet, He says this in Colossians chapter four, verses three through six. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Then he tells them, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your see that, that, excuse me, but let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. So he's praying for new opportunities, new open doors, boldness, so that he would be proclaiming the gospel as he ought to. And then he tells them, he do the same thing. Walk in wisdom. Always be looking for opportunities. Don't waste your time. Seizing your conversation with these gracious words, these gospel words. Know how you're supposed to answer each person who comes your way. 
Yes, we're reliant on the Lord, and yes, we're also to be taking action. But to do what? Right? This is apologetics, so we can call it to engage in. What does it mean to be ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you? Well, this term, apologia, means to make a reasoned defense. Now, it has a technical and a broader meaning. The technical meaning has to do with a legal defense. If you're a defendant, you make your legal defense in that way. But the broader meaning applies here too. So in the one sense, Christians were about to be put on trial if they weren't being put on trial. They were going to find themselves subject to interrogation and all sorts of questioning. But then in the general sense, just anyone can interrogate you on the street. Anyone can ask you, hey, what's, what's with you Christians? You guys to eat other people or what's that? What's that all about? Don't you believe in love? Right? Anyone can interrogate you anywhere. Josh Summers is a pastor in Kansas City, Missouri. He defines apologetics as, I think this is good, this is simple, the science of answering those who question why we believe what we believe as Christians. And so last night, we talked about the distinction between apologetics and evangelism. And you can have evangelism without apologetics, but you can't do apologetics faithfully without evangelism. Evangelism is the proclamation of the person, the work of Jesus Christ, calling people to repent and believe in Christ as Lord, it's the crucified and risen Lord. It's announcing that good news. It might be casually over coffee, but it's still a type of announcing and proclaim. Apologetics is what we locate in prolegomena, first things, things that everything else is predicated upon. This is what makes that plausible. This is setting the stage for that. Apologetics is the framework that goes into why we would even believe these things. Is there a God? Is scripture reliable? Is Jesus who he claims to be historically? And just as there's different approaches to evangelism, different methodologies, some that are good, some that are less good, there's different methodologies with respect to apologetics. So I want to kind of step out of our passage for a minute, and I want to kind of go over four schools of thought for apologetics, and I'll try to be as neutral and dispassionate as possible. Yeah, you're like, not likely. <laughs> well, the first school of thought we'll call fideism. In Latin, fide, being in faith. This we could call blind faith. This we could say maybe a little bit more winsomely, but this is, this is fate without regard for reason, without prior regard for reason. A, a fideist doesn't necessarily deny reason altogether, but they detach faith from reason. I believe it was Tertullian that said, I, I believe so that I may understand it. That would be a fideistic type of statement. I'm not saying Tertullian was a fideist. But the idea being that I'm going to separate rationality from faith. Faith is something other than rationality. Maybe a better example would be Nicholas of Cusa, 15th century Roman Catholic philosopher. He said, because of its inherent strength, faith needs no external support. And then in that same text, he says, Christians believe in God's revelation without it, that it being reason, discursive reason, right? External logic. Does Christians believe without that? If you were here last night, you work, worked through some mock apologetic conversations, some case studies, and one of them was a conversation between two guys, two churchgoers, Richard and Bob. And they've been going to church together for 15 years. Richard says to Bob, hey, been questioning this thing lately. I've been listening to some Harvard professors and some podcasts, and I don't know, I just think some answers. I'm not sure if the Bible is reliable. His friend Bob responds, Oh, sounds like you really care about this lot, man. Hey, knock yourself out. What sides the tailgate? He says, I just believe this because, oh, no, it works for me, and our family likes this church. And that's about all that Bob has to say. This is anti-intellectualism. This is fighting pseudo-intellectualism with anti-intellectualism. Bob is a fideist. I'm not a proponent of fideism. You can probably tell. But a second approach 
falls into another ditch. You know, there's always ditches on both sides of the road. Now, evidentialism, to its favor, seeks to establish empirical evidence for the existence of God, the reliability of Scripture, the historical Jesus, the resurrection, and so forth. So some notable evidentialists would be men like William Lane Craig, uh, the late Dr. Norm Geisler, Josh McDowell, Gary Habermas, Frank Turek, Lee Strobel. These would be prominent evidentialist apologetics. They've done much good for the church. Josh Summers, the same pastor I referenced earlier, he also uh, just helpfully summarizes what these folks are trying to do. He says, evidentialism argues for the probable existence of God based on one's examination of natural effects, which then leads to a speculative conclusion. Let me read that again. Evidentialism argues for the probable existence of God based on one's examination of natural effects, which then leads to a speculative conclusion. Now, Christian faith can absolutely be supported on evidential grounds. After all, it's historic fact. There's two challenges with this school. One is, when we're practicing apologetics on a street level, not everyone in this room, yours truly included, is able to be an expert on archaeology, astrophysics, historicity of the Bible, textual criticism, so forth, right? A second challenge is what the unbeliever does with evidence. That's another challenge to the evidentialist approach. I'll read a text of scripture and give an example. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They may be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal land and birds and animals and creepy things. So man knows God. He sees the evidence. What does he do? He suppresses that in unrighteousness. The image here you can think of is, have you ever tried to hold a beach ball under the water? Not easy to do. You can fight it, you can fight it. Eventually, who's going to win? The beach ball is going to win. It's going to pop up to the surface. That is what the unbeliever is doing with respect to the knowledge of God. Because it's clear that there is a God. I once had a conversation um, at my gym with, with an acquaintance. I, would, I wouldn't quite call him a friend. You know, he's one of those guys. He's a friend acquaintance. His name was Metro. He went by Met. Um, Met was a tough guy. He had just gotten out of prison. He was um, some, somewhat of an egotist. And pretty, pretty abrasive. Refreshing. I'll tell you exactly what he thinks. A lot of people will... And I was discussing the gospel with him one day, and he said, well, I would believe that there's a God if he came right down here and told me. He did. <laughs> it happened 2,000 years ago, not in your lifetime, man. And see, there's no amount of evidence that will convince a person in that state. Because they're saying, well, here's what would happen for me to believe. Well, according to scripture, you already have enough to believe. Because not only does God make himself known to you in, in, in creation, he's calmed down. He said, here I am. <laughs> Run. There's already enough evidence to convict. Another way of putting this is that, that there's no neutrality. We're not in the neutral world anymore. But in reality, we never were. Nothing is neutral. Everyone's mind is made up. How many categories of humanity are there? Those who are alive? To God in Christ, dead in sin and on the fence? No. Those who are dead in sin and those who are alive in Christ. By the way, by the way, don't be afraid you're going to turn someone off from the faith. 
If they're dead in sin, you can't drive them further away from Christ. The pressure's off. They're either dead or alive. Now, don't get me wrong. You can be a helper and hindrance. I'm not saying that there's any way that you could possibly harm a witness. But if you are so dead set on engineering this person on the right circumstances to accept Christ, and you're so worried you're going to say the wrong thing, they're already dead. Can a person get more dead than dead? Are there degrees of dead? No, you're dead or alive in Christ. And he's the one who gives life. One other note about evidentialism. Evidentialism also assumes categories of logical induction yeah. that we only have because there's a rational God who made a rationally ordered world. So by building a case based on, let's say, historical evidence for the resurrection and the trustworthiness of the eyewitnesses, I'm assuming that knowledge is possible. Aren't I? I'm assuming that, that logical induction is possible, that generally reliable witnesses give us a generally reliable record that proves a generally reliable Christ. Now that's valid at reasoning, but it assumes that we're even doing reasoning. There's a lot of people that aren't doing reasoning. And so to answer this, a third school of thought is presuppositionalism. So first we have fideism, evidentialism, presuppositionalism, this school of thought in light of these objectives, these objections rather to evidentialism, this is set forth by the 20th century Westminster theologian Cornelius Van Til, a giant of the faith, a godly man. Uh, there, there's a retired fellow in our office who still works very part-time. Uh, he's in his mid-late 70s. He's planted over 30 churches in Colombia. Dude is a, a titan missionary veteran. He's a, he's a humble giant. He's, he's, he's a short man, but he's a spiritual giant. And Bob, I found out, studied under Cornelius Van Til at Westminster. Like, Bob, what was that like? Studied under Van Til. Bob's like, I don't remember anything. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> that was of no help at all. Well, Cornelius Van Til gives us the primary stream of what's called presuppositionalism. There's another stream from Gordon Clark called axiomatic presuppositionalism. Don't worry about that tonight. And don't ask me to explain it either. I don't think I can. But Vantilianism, this is the view of apologetics that seeks to take into account what we just discussed with Met, what we call the noetic effects of sin. That is the fact that total depravity touches your rational faculties too. It affects your ability to reason. And so Vantil once wrote, arguing that there's no neutrality, he wrote, Everything looks yellow to the jaundiced eye. That was his perspective. Nobody's neutral. We're dealing with people not as impartial observers of facts, but as rebels against God, who are predisposed to reject the argument that we're giving them, which is true. Now, Bansil wasn't opposed to the use of evidences, but he sought to primarily address the unbeliever as a creature of God, living in God's world, borrowing capital from the Christian worldview. Last night we had some mock conversations, excuse me, some mock conversations and addressed the issue of sexuality, LGBT issues. And the accusation comes, well, don't you believe in love? Or how could you, this is, you're a bad person because you reject these ways of life. Well, where do you get goodness? Where do you get acceptance? Where do you get love without a God of those things? That's a presuppositional type of argument. In fact, there's a presuppositional apologetics. His name is Sides and Ruben Cape. Say that five times fast. He resides in Canada and he has a two-step method. And it's simply this. Somebody responds to you with some sort of expression of unbelief or an objection to the Christian faith. And he would say, number one, how do you know that that's true? And number two, how do you get truth without God? Kind of sweeps the legs out from underneath um, Libra's objection. Well, there's other pre, there's other well-known presuppositionalists. Greg Bonson, also from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, was one of the foremost interpreters of Van Til. Van Til was not easy to understand. English was not his first language. Francis Schaeffer was arguably some kind of a presuppositionalist. Uh, men today, like John Frame, Vern Poitras, uh, 
contemporary kind of YouTube podcast personalities, James White, uh, Jeff Durbin, these would all be presuppositional apologists voting Bauckham. So this is a popular growing school of apologetic methodology. Now, in order to go about this, though, at least the Vantillian way, the presuppositionalist has to start out by assuming the existence of God. And they say that because they don't want to use rational arguments to work up to God, because then what's the ultimate principle? Is it God or is it rationality or the power of that argument? And so the presuppositionalist argues for God by assuming the existence of God. Now, I'm not asking you to take a side, but can you see why someone would accuse that of being circular in nature, right? I, I can. I'm sympathetic to that critique. And Greg Bonson would say, yeah, it's circular. In fact, all argumentation is circular. But some of them are vicious circles that are fallacious. And this is, this is the best circle possible that, that's so broad that it encompasses all other forms of argument because it's about God and it circles everything. Well, that would be his response. You could be a judge of whether or not that satisfies him intellectually. But that would be his retort to that. Or at least it was. Bonson is with the board. But then there's another approach. This fourth approach would be classical apologetics. So it takes its signals from the classical synthesis between the Christian worldview and the best of classical theology. Famous popularizer in this generation of that would be R.C. Sproul, a foreman, John Gersten. Of course, the towering figure in this whole movement historically is St. Thomas Aquinas, who's drawing from Aristotle, who's bringing that into a Christian framework. So this seeks to argue not only that God is necessary to make sense of the world. There's not a fundamental disagreement with, for instance, how we would read Romans chapter 1. We know that the fall had an effect on our intellect. We understand the noetic effects of sin, but we also recognize common grace. That yeah, people are inconsistent and irrational. But by God's common grace, people still may respond to rational arguments sometimes, if he should grant them to do so. And so, before going down the evidentialist rabbit hole and giving you historic facts and figures and data, the classical apologist starts by establishing things like the existence of God or the reliability of scripture using rational methods, using logical induction. So Thomas Aquinas had these five ways of establishing the existence of God. You probably remember this from philosophy 101, the five classic theistic proofs. And the first two are the arguments from motion and the argument from causation. Emotion in that medieval philosophical sense doesn't mean moving from one place to another. Rather, motion in that sense means undergoing change, a change from one state to another state. And Thomas, borrowing from Aristotle, says, well, that means that there's either an infinite regress of motions, right, which is impossible, or there's an unmoved mover at the fountainhead of it all. Similarly, he looks at causation. We know that every effect has a cause. There must be an uncaused cause at the beginning of it. A cause which itself is not an effect. It's the final, it's the ultimate cause, the first cause. So these two arguments constitute what's called the cosmological argument. In other words, it's looking at the way the world works. Like we know that, that effect B comes from cause A, it's looking at the way the world works, the cosmos, and saying something that must also be true of God, tracing that back to go. Well, third, Aquinas argues from necessity. He argues that God is a logically necessary being. It's the greatest of all beings. And by that definition, he must exist. He looks at all of the beings, you and I, we both share something in common. We are contingent. In other words, we could not exist. You could conceive of a world in which you were never born. It might not be a wonderful world. It might not be a wonderful life. But you can conceive of a world in which you were not born. It's possible for the universe to exist without you. All of us are contingent. 
But where do we get our being? Well, the Apostle Paul says, in him, in God, we live and move and have our being. There is one logically necessary being, the source of all being. This is the ontological argument relating to being. Fourth, Thomas argues from gradation. We measure things like good and evil in relative amounts. We recognize that there's good. We recognize that there's evil. We recognize that there's degrees in between, potentially. Well, that assumes, does it not, a standard of good. What is the ultimate standard of good? By the way, next time someone raises against you, well, how could a good God allow suffering in the world? Where do you get the idea of suffering as bad without an ultimate standard of good? And where did you get that ultimate standard of good? This is, by the way, where really classical apologetics and presuppositionalism aren't actually that far apart very often times. Because you're appealing to the question of why, what standard are you judging good? This is the moral argument. The fact that there's moral laws written on our minds, our hearts, means that there's a moral law giver. There's a standard, whether we acknowledge it or not. And finally, the argument from design. We look at orderliness in the universe. We look at purpose and intentionality in the natural world. And we argue teleologically based on the telos, the purpose of those things, that there must be a design that created them with a specific endpoint in mind. So those are his five ways. And so a classical apologist does take seriously, again, what Romans chapter one tells us, that the unbeliever knows that there's a God. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been unknown because people are sinful. No, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So God's voice through nature and through reason gets through to people. They know that there's a God. They can't say, well, it was impossible for me to know without pre-existing or without presupposing the existence of God. It says they are unapologetus is the word in Romans 1. They are without an apologetic, unbelievers are. They have no excuse because natural revelation got through. They know that there is a God. There is sufficient rational capability for people to be held accountable to either believe or not believe in this God. Now, the presupposition box looking at the classicists would say, yeah, but you're assuming logical induction. You're assuming this, this sort of reasoning up to God as your ultimate sin, rather than God. See, the presuppositionalist opposes the classical apologist at this point of trying to work up to God rather than starting with God. See, now you have some other standard other than God. It's your ability to reason. It's your ability to conclude from all these specific cases of things like motion and causality to make a conclusion about God. And then the presuppositional is plus the same well, that's and it's backwards. I don't want to brush all of those controversies and intramural debates aside, but they are intramural debates. They really are. We are all playing for the same team, right? These are within the orthodoxy, these views. I will give you a helpful way to think about the difference between these two schools though. And, I, and without saying that the controversy between evidentialism, classical apologists, and presuppositionalism, without saying that it's just a tempest in a teapot, between the classicist and the presuppositionalist, they're going about a similar task in a different order. That's what I'll say. The presuppositionalist is following the order of being. The classicist is following the order of knowing. Let me put that another way. The presuppositionalist is going from ontology to epistemology. It's going from metaphysics to epistemology. Who God is from how do we know anything? The evidence, but excuse me, the classical apologist is going from how do we know things to then how do we know God? Now, we know that God is. God eternally is. He is the basis of reason of rationality of all of these things. Amen. And men and women on both sides of these issues would say amen to them. The challenge is, do I have to argue in that line every single time? 
Or can I also argue in this line? Is it true that humans with rationality, with faculties that yes are affected by the fall, but also with common grace, restraining them, enabling society to function, can I help people argue from the specifics in the world up to the conclusions about God? Can I do that? Does a child on his mother's breast reason as follows? Well, there's a God, and in him I live and move and have my being, and I am dependent on heaven. And he has immediately put my mother in between me and him as a source of his provision, and through her I receive milk. And so, mother, I am ready. Or does he think I'm hungry? <laughs> okay. I would submit to you that we are free in Christ. If we're fearing God, if we're honoring Christ as Lord above all things, not letting the unbeliever be the judge, right? But recognizing God's the judge, the unbeliever, yes, is living in God's world, borrowing God's air, breathing it, arguing against God. We can, we can argue that way, and we can also build these rational arguments. I would argue that the two aren't that far apart. And there's multiple tools for multiple jobs. And sometimes when you get a shiny new hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And you want to take the same tool and use it for every single task, but anyone who's experienced in working with their hands knows there's different tools for different jobs. So brothers and sisters, let's not be daunted by these intramural debates. Honestly, I think that Aquinas and Van Til are yupping it up in heaven right now over a couple pints, laughing at all of us, kind of stretching our brains to comprehend all of it. And so let's consider a few final encouragements here. And we skipped over the last phrase here, that we are to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. A reason for the hope that is within you. So what about this hope? Well, first it's subjective. In other words, it's in you. This is personal. This is you and your story. It's also objective. Peter doesn't say to answer someone who asks a reason for your hope. This isn't just, why are you so hopeful? Why are you so optimistic? It isn't just that, it's more than that. He refers to the hope that is within you. Similar to what Jude says, Jude verse three, that we are to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. There is an objective hope, the blessed of the Lord Jesus Christ, the content of the Christian faith. That is what we defend. You can share your story. You can share your testimony. You should. That hope needs to be within you. You need to be exemplifying it. Your life needs to speak to the fact that you value these things. But your testimony is not the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. Work in your testimony, fine. But nobody ever got saved because, well, God has just blessed me so much. Now they get saved because Christ died for sinners. And so remember the hope that is within you. After all, that objective Christian faith, that's not going anywhere. Positive world or negative world or anything in between. Assyrian invasion, LGBTQ mind cult, it's not going anywhere after 2,000 years of onslaught. Which is why Peter concludes in this way, and this is our third and final point, that we must fear God, that we must be ready, and that we must suffer well. This is where we began in seeing that Peter is speaking to people that yet are facing opposition from the watching world. Which is why he tells them, yeah, defend the faith, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Verse 16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And gentleness here, uh, I'm reading the English Standard Version. Your version might say weakness. The idea of gentleness, this is bridled strength. This is channeled power. This is not softness. There's so much soft-headedness in the name being Winslow in the evangelical world right now in an attempt to get people on our side. This type of gentleness, this is strength under control. You know, when I'm playing with my kids, once in a while, this happens to any young dad of like, we get a little so excited, our kids might get hurt. Like, I can only throw them on the bed so many times before somebody like breaks an ankle, right? 
But in reality, my small children are not experiencing the smallest fraction of my strength. I can break that in half. Of course I'm not. As the father is tender with his children, as God is tender with us, we are to be tender. Yes, we're wielding a living and active, sharp and powerful two-edged sword of the word of God. And we do so with gentleness and respect. And this word respect here, again, the PSV doesn't help us much here. The word is fear. It's phobos, a phobia, it's fear. It's echoing what Peter's already said. Don't fear man, fear God. Defend your faith and do so with fear. There's a parallel happening there. Was, don't be afraid of the unbeliever, but let your fear be God. And if you fear God, you're not going to become unhinged. You're not going to become the type of person that you're arguing against. You're not going to get into the mud with them. You're not going to get down on their level. There's a prominent political commentator who just announced a divorce who was going through pretty ugly scandal. And this is one of those fellows who he claimed the name of Christ, probably still does. But there's no gentleness and there's no weakness. And is it really much of a surprise that now his own testimony is ruined and there's all sorts of accusations of abusive behavior and his leadership and his marriage and his company? And we can't become what we argue against. One of the commentaries that I was looking at this passage points out that this matters when we're called to suck. When the world is opposed to us. And it matters because when you're falsely accused, or as he says here, when you're slandered, when people are reviling your good behavior in Christ. So this is not a true accusation. This is a false accusation. That's when you're more tempted than ever to cast off or strength, to cast off weakness. It's when you're defending yourself. That's when we have to be especially guarded. Listen, the enemy right now in the spiritual world wants the people in this room to take the bait. Don't take the bait. Take this message home to your churches, to your families. Don't take the bait. They want to kick the dog and kick the dog and kick the dog so that when the dog bites back, they'll be justified in shooting it. Don't give the enemy what the enemy wants. Be meek. Be gentle. Show Christian love. And if you refuse to take the bait, if you do that, Peter says, those who revile your good behavior will be put to shame. Their mouths will be stopped. They won't have anything to say against you. It'll be like Daniel. They said, and he's upright. He's so upright that we'll only be able to raise accusation with him on the basis of the law of his God. Remember, they had to make him a new law that he could break, which was not praying to anyone but, but the king. Let that be you. Let there be nothing in your life. That isn't above reproach. It's someone who couldn't point at. And we can't change their hearts, but we can shut their mouths. John Calvin said that the role of an apologist is not to convert the hearts of the ungodly, but to stop their obstreperous mouths, to silence the boasting of unbelievers. I had someone in my family years ago who married it. An unbeliever married into a largely Christian family. And my grandmother, God bless her, she's now with the Lord. But she would say often, oh, we'll just bluff him into the carry. It doesn't work that way. You can't only love someone into the kingdom. The spirit gives life. Flesh profits nothing. You can't change their heart with your gentleness and your meekness. But what can you do? Well, you can silence their boasting mallets. And the Lord controls the heart to save is God work, the God's work. Ours is to be faithful as witnesses and as apologists, no matter what school of thought we belong to. Our role as apologists is to fear God, it's to be ready to give an answer, and it's to suffer well. Well, congratulations, you made it to the end of another episode of the Missions Podcast. The Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE. To learn more about ABWE, 
head on over to abwe.org. And to learn more about the Missions Podcast and get more content like this, go to missionspodcast.com. The Lord would put it on your heart to support this ministry. We are so grateful for those who've done so, and you can hit the support tab on our website to do that. Of course, share the show with a friend. Leave us a positive rating and review. We mentioned that at the top of the show. And until next week, whether you're watching or listening or following us on YouTube, however you come to us, we're glad you joined us.